Okay, everybody, I think we will get started. Uh, so good evening and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sarah DeFeo, and I'm the Vice President of Scientific Affairs and Programs here at Ovarian Cancer Research Fund Alliance. And I want to thank you all for joining us today as we kick off our webinar series for 2018 with today's presentation, Federal Policymaking and Advocacy 101. So just a little background about our organization. Ovarian Cancer Research Fund Alliance is the largest global organization dedicated to fighting ovarian cancer. We advance research to prevent, treat, and defeat ovarian cancer, support women and their families before, during, and beyond diagnosis, and work with all levels of government to ensure ovarian cancer is a priority. So before I get started, I have just a few housekeeping notes to go through. All you listeners will be in a listen-only mode throughout the presentation. We should have some time for questions um, afterwards. So if you think of, think of a question as you're listening, you can type it into the Q&A box, which should be visible on the lower right-hand side of your screen. And there's no need to wait until the presentation is over to submit your questions. You can just type them in as we go along and as you think of them, and we will answer them at the end. Also, um, because people always ask, yes, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be available for download and re-listen on the OCRFA website starting tomorrow. So, about our presenters. So, we're very lucky uh, to have two terrific colleagues of mine here with us today, um, Chad Ramsey and Vanessa Kramer. Chad Ramsey is our Vice President of Policy here at OCRFA. He oversees the development and implementation of our national agenda for ovarian cancer. He works with policymakers on Capitol Hill and our organizational allies to implement the policy agenda and achieve our priorities. He also serves as a staff liaison to the Congressional Ovarian Cancer Caucus and monitors efforts within federal agencies. Before we lured him to OCRFA in uh, 2015, Chad was the Director of Legislative Relations for the National Marrow Donor Program. And um, previously, he had served as the Director of Federal Legislation for the Brady Campaign uh, to prevent gun violence. And he has more than 18 years of experience in public policy and advocacy in the nonprofit sector. Um, Chad will be joined tonight by his right hand, Vanessa Kramer, who joined OCRFA in 2017. She works closely with Chad um, on our policy agenda and steering advocacy strategy at federal and state levels and helps track legislative and regulatory developments of interest. Prior to joining us, Vanessa worked on Capitol Hill for Congressman Gary Ackerman and most recently as staff for the House Energy and Commerce Committee Select Investigative Panel. She's also worked in the Government Relations Department at Planned Parenthood and in the private sector lobbying and consulting for a range of healthcare clients. So, Without further ado, let's get down to it. So, Chad and Vanessa, I will pass the mic to you, and you guys can get started when you're ready. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks for that lengthy introduction. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we're excited that everybody could take, take their time to join. Uh, we, won't, um, we won't mince words. We'll try to get right into it so that people can get back to their lives. Uh, but we really appreciate you taking the time with us. It's a very fitting time, the beginning of the year. There's a lot of exciting things happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, but we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to sort of hit the basics on, um, on what sort of advocacy we do, uh, why it's important. And uh, for those of you who are new to the advocacy world or new to OCRFA in general, this will be a good primer to get you going. Um, as usual, um, Vanessa does all the work around here, so you're going to hear her voice mostly um, on this slide deck. Um, and if you have questions, please go ahead and, and, and put them into the, um, the box there on the WebEx. Um, but we'll also probably have time at the end to, to, take, some call, uh, to take some questions and address those um, as soon as we can. Okay, so here we go. Here's the agenda. We're going to go through um, each of these, um, and um, I think it'll all make sense at the end. But at this point, I'm just going to pass it over to uh, to Vanessa. 
Thank you, Chad. Yeah, so this, we're going to go over a lot of material. We're keeping it pretty top line. But as Chad said, feel free to ask questions. And if your question does not get, um, if you don't get to ask your question at the end of this webinar, then by all means, drop Chad or myself an email, and we'll get back to you. So this is the agenda. First, we're going to go over what advocacy is. Um, you know, this term is thrown around a lot, and it means different things to different people. So we're going to tell you how we define it. And then we move on to the current congressional landscape. So that ties in to advocacy because these are the people we're targeting when we advocate. Then we're going to go into Federal Policymaking 101. This is an overview for how the sausage is, is made. Um, and then we're going to zoom in on a particular piece of policy, the federal funding process. Uh, this is the federal budget and appropriations process. And we're going to look at that more closely because tis the season. We're, That's right. we're about to get started on that. Then we're going to go into our policy priorities organizationally. And then we're going to come full circle and put it all into context, returning to advocacy. So what's advocacy? So this is our definition. I have to tell you, lots of different people have different definitions, different organizations. Um, offer slightly different definitions, but at the end of the day, advocates are agents for change. And so the way OCRFA defines advocacy is any activity or action that aims to influence the culture and shift public perception to advance a particular cause, achieve a specific outcome, or change in the status quo. So advocacy, it doesn't have to be policy advocacy necessarily. You could be advocating in your neighborhood for something to happen, for people to be more diligent about picking up their dog's poop or something like that. You could be advocating your school for something. You could be advocating any institution. It doesn't have to be directed at elected officials. But it often is because the most effective way or an effective way to achieve the kind of large-scale high impact change that you want to see in, in the current culture is through influencing policy outcomes. Yeah, and this is a, what is advocacy is a question I get a lot, usually when I'm outside of Washington, D.C. Yeah, here in, there are so many sorts of advocacy organizations in the district um, that it's become common parlance, and so we throw it around. But when we, when I get, when I go back home to upstate New York or I travel in other places and I talk about doing advocacy, I do get this question, and so I think Vanessa did a good job of um, breaking it down. And I'm sure everyone on this call has a good sense of it, but we wanted to give you what our idea of advocacy is. Yes. So who are the targets? So as I said, advocacy could be directed at anyone, but for these purposes, it's going to be our policymakers and our federal policymakers. Uh, so in particular, there are two different types of policymakers. You have your regulators and your legislators. They're either appointed or elected. Legislators are elected. So you always want to direct your advocacy toward the person who you're voting for. Um, this gives them incentive to listen to you. And even if this person does not have direct jurisdiction or control over the policy issue that you're interested in, they, you should think of them as your touchstone to the federal government. These would be your elected officials, your members of Congress. Um, because even if they can't do anything about the specific issue, usually they're in a better position to apply pressure on whatever public official can. So by way of example, if you don't like a regulation that just came out of the Department of Health and Human Services, you should still go to your member of Congress with that grievance, even though your member of Congress had no say over that regulation. This is because your member of Congress is going to be listened to by the administration, by the person who issued that regulation. So it's always going to be your member of Congress. So everyone, most of us anyway, us in DC, <laughs> we don't have a voting member, but we have three members of Congress. So you have two senators, and then you have one House representative. And then we have agency regulators, but those are appointed by the president. So um, moving on. <laughs> Why bother? So what's the point? It can be really, really hard to actually get through 
to your elected official. I think that very, very infrequently do constituents get to meet with them or get any sort of direct contact. Usually it is with their staff. So it begs the question, what's the point of all of this? And in the policy world, to make things happen, it, it often is, is a slow, drawn-out process. So, well, <laughs> the reason is that it's all worth it and it all comes together at the end of the day is because as I mentioned before, policy is such an effective way of instituting large-scale change. And in particular, as it applies in healthcare, what do these public officials do? What is their influence? What's their sphere of influence? So for starters, regulation of government insurance programs. These are Medicare, Medicaid, um, CHIP for children, and SSDI, which is Social Security Disability Income, all of those entitlement programs that offer health services. Those are policymakers, your federal policymakers, who are determining what that coverage looks like. Um, you know, at w w any sort of standards, setting standards, setting parameters. And most recently, um, the, they have started, the federal government has started, and this kicked off with the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, they have started regulating or deregulating, as the case is in the past year, but the private insurance market. And so, just for some context, before the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010, private insurers really were self-regulated, um, which is why there was so much resistance toward the ACA uh, by insurers. So the second bullet is direct resources and funding. So any sort of federal funding, um, that has to be passed in legislation, it has to be signed off on. And so your member of Congress is the person that you want to communicate your spending priorities to. And, you know, this sounds a little cheesy, but I will say those are your tax dollars and you should feel empowered to indicate your preferences, where that money goes um, to your member of Congress. So don't, don't be bashful, that this is your money, that's your money, those are public funds. Increasing issue visibility is the third bullet. So, you know, members of Congress obviously garner a lot more attention than the average Joe or Jane on the street. And so they can be used as almost a mouthpiece to amplify your issue. If they're talking about your issue, then more likely than not, more people are going to hear what they have to say and um, it's gonna get picked up by some sort of press outlet. So it's, it's great if you're trying to uh, raise an issue publicly. And then the fourth bullet is very topical. So it, the past year, we've, we've seen a renewed emphasis on the constituent voice and grassroots. Uh, this is, I think, because there have been a lot of surprises at the ballot box. And I feel that, and Chad, you can speak to this too, I'm sure, that members of Congress are listening more now than ever before. Um, you know, whichever side of the aisle you're on, Trump being elected surprised everyone. And there have since been lots of elections that have surprised everyone. And so um, members are listening, <laughs> they're alert, and it's a good time to make an impression, to make an impact. Yeah, and you may be concerned about um, having your voice heard in this sea of white noise from from constituents all, all over the place on all sorts of different issues, and that is something to be to to be aware of. Um, but we can speak with a lot of confidence that we've seen one dedicated advocate from a particular congressional district have a really big impact on this issue in particular. You'll see someone who has a relationship with a member of Congress and they'll see them coming and they'll be like, oh, okay, whatever you need, whatever you need, um, I'm going to co-sponsor the legislation or I'm going to do what you want because um, they uh, they know that um, listening to constituents who are motivated and who will get out there in the public and make noise for them or help them out um, when, it comes, when it comes time for um, re-election, um, we know that they are sensitive to those voices. And so um, that's always something to consider as you move forward. Your, your voice can, you make that one connection and you're gonna be able to have a real oversized impact on the issue. So where do you fit in? So you are constituents living in your senator's state or your congressman's 
um, your representative's district. So that's what that word means for those of you who don't know. Um, but, and if you've ever called a congressional office, typically the first question is, are you a constituent? Um, so as we just touched on, constituents are playing an increasingly large role right now. Constituents and patients generally have always played a, a significant role in setting the debate in healthcare in particular. Um, you know, the, the great thing about having advocates and getting people on the Hill to meet with their members of Congress is that it really gives meaning to these policies that are passed. It's all very abstract until you have someone standing before you who's directly impacted by this. And with healthcare, I think that there's a particular degree of sensitivity around that because, you know, your health really is your wealth. And these can be, uh, these decisions can ha have, be, be the difference between life and death. So I think that in the healthcare policy space, the patient voice is especially important. That's the constituent voice, really, because all of us are patients. So you vote, you have a voice in the debate. And this is sort of, again, going over what Chad said. Members of Congress have an inherent interest in pleasing constituents that, <laughs> It is from their inherent interest in being reelected. It's job security. And so they are very eager, as they're eager to get your ask and to deliver on them so that they can take it back home as a win. So squeaky wheel gets the grease. So as Chad said, you know, it can be a challenge distinguishing yourself in the sea of, of noise because everyone's advocating for something all the time. And members of Congress have hundreds of thousands, millions in some cases, constituents. So how, how do you be heard? And really persistence is key and also organizing, building a broader base, training people, soliciting your friends, neighbors, others in the district or in the state to echo your message is very helpful. Start a, a movement to the, to, to the greatest extent you can because in Congress it really is the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That's right, and um, sometimes this, the squeaky wheel is someone who tweets a lot or someone who um, happens to land a letter to the editor. Um, and and uh, up above when we talk about members legislating by anecdote, how many times have you seen this during the health care debate or in other, any sort of major issue debate where a member of Congress will take to the floor and say, well, I have a constituent, Mary Jones, who came to my office and told me that she's not getting proper health insurance coverage because of this policy. And, and um, that, that happens very often. And so it may be, sometimes it may be a member of Congress just reinforcing their position with a constituent. But, you know, I've found oftentimes that it's strengthened their position, turned, turned someone who might have been supportive into someone who's going to be a leader. And we really need leaders on issues like ours in order to enact change. Yes, yeah, and so just to build off of what Chad said, you know, members, if you're a constituent and you have a meeting with a staffer, one of your members of Congress, Congress's staff people, and give them a story that is especially compelling and that they're moved by, and it could be about, like, insurance denying coverage for something or any number of things, it might be a springboard for them introducing legislation to enact a permanent fix. And when that happens, we hear members referencing the story that inspired this, this legislation, this particular piece of legislation. So it, it is, it can be huge. The stakes are big. Yeah, that's right. Because you might be Laird Lance sitting in your competitive district in New Jersey and thinking, oh, I need something to distinguish myself. I need to get out in front. I need my constituents to know that I'm working hard for them. Um, how am I going to do that? Bang, he meets with a, uh, someone who's suffering from ovarian cancer in his district, and he's like, I'm going to take up the mantle and lead the charge for this piece of legislation and take to the floor and, and make a big speech on this, and then I'm going to use that as a springboard to my visibility and to show people that I care about women's issues. And to continue along those lines, this is precisely why you're better off if you build your troops. If you organize more of his constituents, and really um, make it seem like this is a, there's a great desire within his district, within among his voters, to make something happen, and that's even better. So let's take a wider look at what we're talking about here. All right, so Congress, and this is bare bones, very basic here. So we are in the 115th Congress. 
It ends in 2019. That's the congressional session. Congressional sessions last two years. Each congressional session, the slate is wiped clean. So you can think of them almost as school years. And this is important because for two reasons. The first is that all legislation dies after a congressional session is over. So it either has to be reintroduced or it just dies and that, that's that. Uh, and then it also matters because the committees are subject to change. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but committees and party leadership is subject to change. So even if you have an election where things remain static, you know, maybe the numbers don't change significantly and all, all incumbents are able to keep their seats, you might have significant changes just because it's an opportunity for, for the people in charge to reorganize things. So committee assignments are subject to change um, and leadership roles. So uh, in the House, you have um, two-year terms. So that means that they're up for election every two years. This is important because House members, it's said that they're sort of constantly in campaign mode. And I think that that's true. They don't really get to sit back and take a break. Um, it's tough for them, but it's great for us because that means the desire to please constituents is always top of mind for them because, as I said, they're constantly in campaign mode. So House members represent congressional districts. And congressional districts uh, comprise about 650 700,000 people. So each congressional district is about that big. These districts are redrawn every 10 years. Sometimes very creatively. Yes, according to the census. And um, they, so you can have states that have maybe one, sparsely populated states will only have a handful or even one congressional district. Um, so this is the difference between the House and the Senate. Senators, every state gets two senators, and senators serve six-year terms. So if you're a senator and you've been newly elected, you can kind of sit back and relax a little bit um, and nestle into your job because you've got six years before you're up for re-election. Now, this, this gives them sort of an opportunity to maybe take more risks than their House counterparts. On the one hand, on the other hand, we, we don't always see that. <laughs> um, but moving on. All right, so political climate and power dynamics. So currently we have Republicans in all three branches of government. So in the context of Congress, Congress is two chambers, the House and the Senate. In the context of Congress, this means that they have the majority. So what does it mean when we say majority? It means they have majority control. They mm -hmm. occupy they have more members than the minority party. Um, they have more than 50%. 50%. Yes, I'm trying to think of an artful way to put that in here. Um, so uh, Republicans have majority control over both chambers, and this year is an election year, and that is a big deal because it sort of changes things. Every, every legislator is hyper aware of what voters are thinking and how to appeal to them. Um, and in the Senate, you know, anxiety spikes around re-elections because it's a little bit different. Um, a third of the Senate is up for re-election every two years. They stagger their elections. This is because they don't want two senators from the same state running at the same time. And so 2018, we have 34 senators up for re-election. And Republicans, this, the way the, it breaks down, Republicans are favored because you have eight Republicans up for re-election and then you have 26 Democrats up for re-election. So that's really not always the case, um, you know, and there's no sort of say for, for what, what the party breakdown is going to be. But that essentially means you're going to have 26 senators who are in office now fighting for their, for their seats, to keep their Senate seats. Mm -hmm. And 10 of these senators are in states that Trump won. So um, this, there's a lot of anxiety around this, and especially even, even this week in the context of the vote on the, on the government spending bill and immigration, everyone was talking about how this could impact the election and how, you know, I mean, this is swaying a lot of um, 
senators who are in cycle, this is swaying their votes, and here it is, like, almost, you know, a year out. Yeah, controversial uh, votes become um, less likely to, to take place the closer we get to elections as people try to um, protect their um, image as they get towards the election. But you will see more sort of message votes that are aimed sometimes at giving uh, members of Congress or senators that are in difficult districts an opportunity to show their constituents that they're voting the right way. Um, and conversely, you will have sometimes the other party, people in the other party, trying to force votes on issues that they know are controversial and they know might read poorly for someone who's up in a tough re-election. Right. So there's a lot of shenanigans um, to, to that end. Yeah, and like we have here, um, while it's just a simple majority to pass legislation in the Senate, um, it's become standard practice to um, require 60 votes, to which is called, in, in, called invoking cloture, um, which basically ends debate and moves to final passage um, on the floor. And so most votes in the Senate do require this 60 vote threshold, which makes it difficult for any party, particularly with a, a narrow majority like the Republicans currently have, to pass legislation um, without negotiating with, with the minority party, in this case, the Democrats. And we'll get into that a little bit down yeah. the road. Um, So here are the, our current beautiful, oh, our current beautiful faces. Oops. So composition <laughs> of Congress. I think we got ahead of ourselves yeah. a little bit. So as Chad said, the Republicans have the majority in the Senate, but it's a very, very narrow majority. Yeah. We have 51 Republicans, two Independents, and 47 Democrats. Now. The two independents, well, they're technically independents, they caucus with the Democrats, and that means that they pretty much vote always religiously reliably with the Democrats. Yep. Uh, then in the House, this is interesting. It's an interesting landscape in the House. We have 239 Republicans, 193 Democrats, and three vacancies. So the Republicans do have a significant majority over the Democrats on the one hand, on the other hand, the House Freedom Caucus, and these are the more conservative Republicans in the House, it's about a 40-member voting bloc, they are tough, and they have no qualms about voting against Republicans or holding out um, on certain things to try and, and, and do some horse trading to try and negotiate other policies they're looking for. Which is what they're doing right now. Right. If you, if you, you know, follow the news of the day, um, the House and the Senate are trying to pass a, um, well, they still haven't passed the budget. We'll get into this a little bit more, but there, there there's currently a, a debate over um, a continuing resolution to fund the government. Um, the Freedom uh, Caucus, uh, came out yesterday and announced that they they don't have enough votes to to support passage in the House. Um, what we typically see from this group is that they try to use this to exact some um, some favors, um, some changes to move things in a more conservative way from um, House leadership. And I think that that may be what's yeah, happening now. Yeah, exactly. And so just. You know, if you look at the numbers, because I think in application this is a little abstract, but if you bring a measure to the House floor, if you are the Republican Speaker of the House, you bring a measure to the House floor, and you lose 40 votes, it's assumed you're going to lose the Democratic votes, because usually most things are along party lines. You add 40 to 193, then you look at the Republicans' numbers, you can see how they don't, they need those members' votes. So while they're small, we say it's the tail that wags the dog. They really do have a lot of control, and they have been successful in 2013, I believe it was, in shutting down the government before. So they're really not messing around. They're very fiscally conservative. I will also tell you that the House Freedom Caucus and all of the trouble that they've, they've stirred up, that was part of the reason that John Boehner, who was former Speaker of the House, resigned. Um, because he just he could not get their buy-in. So it's it's interesting because a lot of more con more 
establishment Republicans, more mainline re Republicans, really, really loathe them um, because they, they have obstructed a lot of legislation, Republican legislation. Yeah, and when it when the Democrats have been in control, they've had their own um, voting blocks that have also earned similar scorn from the majority um, or the mainstream Democrats. I'm looking at you, Blue Dog Democrats, yeah. and others. Yeah. But um, it tends to happen, and um, it's it's you know a good way for a, a smaller group of people or caucus to have an impact. Definitely, and I will say that I think that the House Freedom Caucus is notable because I'd wager to say, well, you're right, there have been sort of progressive flanks of the Democratic Party um, before. They're probably the biggest and most successful in recent history, yeah. at least, at overthrowing votes. So um, it's important to keep them happy. Yeah, so let's take a look at our uh, glorious leaders in Congress right now. So we have we have the Senate, first step in the Senate here. So as I said, the Republican Party occupies the majority of both chambers. So that means that they are the big kahunas in, in both houses of Congress. So in the Senate, we have Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So what does he do in his role as Senate Majority Leader? So he is basically the boss of the Senate. He decides what pieces of legislation come to the floor for a vote. He decides, he sets the, he influences, I should say, the committee schedule. So, you know, there are different committees that focus on different policy subjects, and Mitch McConnell can, can direct those agendas, um, you know, if he's got a specific legislative priority. So he, he, sets, he sets the agenda, essentially, for the whole, whole body, the whole Senate body. Then we have Republican Whip John Cornyn. So a whip is someone that is used to whip votes. This means that when a bill comes to the floor, John Cornyn's staff is calling all of the Republicans in the Senate to ensure that they are voting the right way. And so, you know, if you're kind of mushy middle or if you equivocate or indicate that your boss is unsure, then John Cornyn will try to bring him over. Yeah, and um, they've gotten really good at this, um, both sides. And so that's why you rarely see a piece of legislation make it to the floor that doesn't pass or, or um, that, that the majority wants to see pass. And so that's why it was such dramatic theater when the attempt to repeal um, the Affordable Care Act failed late last year um, because you know, Cornyn thought that he knew which way McCain was going to go, and he, he was wrong. He was wrong, that's, yeah. a, that's a rare occurrence. And along those same lines, when several months prior to that, Speaker Ryan was going to vote to repeal the ACA, there was all this excitement, and then at the 11th hour, he pulled the vote. And that was huge because, to Chad's point, they don't want to bring anything to the floor, and because it's their call, unless it's going to be a win. They don't want egg on their face. So then we have minority leader in the Senate. Minority leader is Chuck Schumer from New York. And in the minority leader position, you're the boss of the minority, but you're really in largely a reactionary role. And so I'm sure that you've seen Senator Schumer hold lots of press conferences around immigration um, and, and other hot issues. And he is leading the Democrats in their, um, in their defensive strategy for some of this, these Republican pro proposals that, that um, disagree with the Democratic platform. So then his right hand is Dick Durbin, Senator Dick Durbin from Illinois. He is the Democratic whip. So it's the same thing that John Cornyn does, except for the Democrats. And because Democrats are not in the majority, it's, um, less, it's less of an intense role because you're not really whipping a lot of votes because you're not choosing what votes come up. But still, you might urge members to co-sponsor things. You basically just want to make sure that your party is all in line. Right, and just being a part of Senate leadership or congressional leadership means you get more staff, you get a nice office in the Capitol building, um, and you're, you have an outsized role as far as your influence goes on the rest of, of your caucus. That's true. Then we have in the House, we have House Speaker Paul Ryan. So he's like the 
Senate Majority Leader for the House. Uh, he decides what bills come to the floor for a vote. And he works closely with House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy in doing that. And so, you know, House Speaker Ryan might indicate his priorities for the quarter. And Majority Leader McCarthy is the person who actually schedules it and makes it happen. And so, um, they work together to set the floor schedule and decide kind of the direction of, of the House. And you have Republican Whip Steve Scalise. He is whipping the votes, again, for the Republicans. Um, then we have Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi. So again, similar, in the, the same vein as Senator Schumer, she is leading the caucus, the Democrats, in the House. Um, and you know, we'll convene press conferences and other things. But as I said, in this role, it's largely reactionary when you are in the minority. So, you know, all you can really do is press conferences, messaging, things of that nature. So then moving down, we have Democratic Whip, again, um, whipping support for Democratic initiatives. All right, let's move on. All right. How does legislation get passed? That's a great question, <laughs> and we see so little of that happen nowadays. Right? But this is how it's supposed to happen. Yes. Okay, so first up, a bill is introduced by what we call a sponsor. The sponsor is the main person who's leading the bill, introducing the bill. Every bill has one sponsor. It may be co-sponsored by several other members, but there's just one person who has their name on the bill as a sponsor. So once a bill is introduced, it is assigned a number, and this is largely based on the sequence in which the bill is introduced. So if it's H.R. 530, that means that it was the 530th bill introduced that, that session. Now, that applies except for the first 20 bills, so H.R. 1 through 20 and S. 1 through 20. So the first 10 of those are reserved for the majority, and the second ones, so 11 through 20, are reserved for the minority. They're prestige. Bills. Yes. Yes. Well, these are how it really is you rank your priority. So HR1, when you see a bill called HR1 or S1 or S2 or S3, that means that it is a very high-ranking priority um, for that party, for, for Congress. So, you know, Speaker Ryan and um, Majority Leader McConnell are the ones who get to decide what those first 10 bills, what issues those are. And it's always, um, usually they hold them until near the end of the session and there's a lot of fervor when, when those are introduced. And there'll be several thousand bills introduced. In any given Congress, that's right. So after the bill is introduced, given a number, it's then assigned to a committee of jurisdiction. So what does that mean? A committee of jurisdiction is whatever committee, congressional committee, oversees the issue that the legislation affects. And so I think there are maybe 20 committees in the House, 20 committees in, in the Senate, and we'll go over which ones are, are, are most important for the purposes of health policy in a second. But it's assigned to this committee. Then the committee decides, the committee chairman decides whether or not to take it up. If, if they decide to take it up, they might have hearings on the bill, which basically means you have subject experts come and testify about the virtues of the bill or potentially the, the dangers of the bill. Then it can be advanced to a markup. So some bills will just have hearings and that's it. They go no further. But usually if a hearing's happened, it indicates that there is the appetite to advance this bill. Um, and so then it graduates to a markup. And in committee, a markup is where members of that committee get to offer amendments uh, to the bill, and they're either they're voted on by the committee and either adopted or rejected. And then the committee has to take a final vote uh, at the end, deciding whether or not to report the bill out of committee. Uh, ordered to report is what it's called. And so this is standard in, bo in both chambers, except the House, there is a little procedural gimmick that you can do where you can bypass committee entirely 
and bring the bill straight to the floor if you get what's called a discharge petition signed. Um, and this is, you would have to do that by 218 members of the House, so a majority of the House. So sometimes you'll hear things about that, um, but typically, it's not, not typical because if you think about it, you know, if Speaker Ryan wants a bill to come to the floor and it's a high-ranking priority, he'll probably tell the committee leadership and because he's the big cheese, they'll probably, the committee chairman would probably go ahead and take the bill up and advance it. So it's highly unusual for that to happen. It can only happen in the House if it does happen. Yeah, and sometimes it's threatened, and sometimes there's a discharge petition that's launched, and you start getting signatures. Um, and that's just really a way to so, show the seriousness, generally, of, of a minority party to push for a legislation piece of legislation that the speaker won't move on. Um, I, I can't remember a time when one has been successful and a bill has passed, um, at least in my 18, 20 years. Um, but this is important for us now to remember the two-year cycle. As we said, it, all this has to happen within um, one Congress, so one two-year cycle. And what we'll often see is a legislation, piece of legislation will take several years um, before it can get passed. And what I mean is, you'll get you'll get so many co-sponsors in one year, then you'll get a um, you'll you'll get no hearing. Then the next Congress, you get a hearing, and maybe the next Congress, you get a markup. And so it takes time. Progress is incremental. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And I mean, to that point, because it does take time, the committee action, well, at the end of the day, you might really want a bill to get passed. Usually the committee action is helpful to your bottom line in building the support, getting the word out there what this bill does. Um, and okay, so then moving on, I'm gonna pick it up a little bit. So in after it leaves committee, after it's voted favorably um, to go to the complete chamber, in the House, it goes to the Rules Committee. So in the Rules Committee, they set a, a rule, they structure a rule for this floor debate for that bill. And so that limits the time. Typically, these rules look something like this. Debate is for an hour divided equally by both parties, and then that's it. And they also decide whether or not there will be amendments offered on the floor. So with the Senate, they don't have a rules committee. So once it advances out of committee, it goes straight to the floor and they debate it and then they vote on it. So in the House, after getting this, the rule and being reported out by the rules committee, then it goes to the floor, it's debated, voted on. So then if you have both chambers passing the same legislation, you're going to have to come together and reconcile the differences. And so that's when conference committees are if assigned. There are any. If there if there are any differences, I should say. Um, it, so conference committees, basically, it's a conference committee in the House, a conference committee in the Senate, and they decide what the final compromise should be, and they issue a conference report which details that final compromise, and then that must be passed by both chambers. And this can be very important. It was just very important for us uh, late last year when a conference report um, was able to strike language that was put in the Senate bill that would have affected the uh, funding for one of the programs that funds ovarian cancer research. Right. And so um, every step of the way offers you an opportunity to have an impact. Yes, yeah. And so in the Senate, because remember, those bills don't go to rules committee, so there's no cap on debate. In the Senate, uh, and this is, I think, the defining feature of the Senate, Debate is unlimited unless cloture is invoked. As Chad mentioned earlier, this requires 60 votes. Otherwise, senators can filibuster, which basically means talking a bill to death <laughs> legislation. And so really in the Senate, it's considered majority, a safe majority when you've got 60 members um, in your party and the Senate doesn't have that. Remember, they only have 51. So it's, it complicates things. Oh, well, then we go to the president. The president yes. either signs or yes. vetoes. Sorry. So yes. here, there are three key differences for our purposes between chambers and in the way bills advance. The first is the rules on debate, which we already talked about. And the second is amendments. So House requires that amendments are germane. Germane means that they relate to the subject matter of the bill. 
So in the House, you can't attach an amendment on health care to legislation to reauthorize the Federal Aviation Agency because the two have nothing to do with each other. In the Senate, you can. So um, it's always uh, interesting in the Senate because you can attach, like this was how Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. It was attached to the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, it, it provides you the opportunity to attach a piece of legislation you care about to something unrelated, some must-pass bill. Um, so, and then the third difference is revenue raising measures or appropriations bills, funding bills must originate in the House. Um, they have the power over the purse. So committees of jurisdiction, remember when a bill is introduced, it's assigned to a committee of jurisdiction. So our big committees for health care uh, policy are the appropriations committee. I think that's a biggie for everyone who has a dog in the fight. These are the, the funding levels of, of pet programs and other things. Then you have the finance committee and the help committee in the Senate. And so because of the jurisdiction that they have over issues, Medicare, Medicaid, health policy, most legislation we care about is assigned to one of those two committees in the Senate. But then the House, again, Appropriations Committee is a big one. Um, then we have Ways and Means Committee and House Energy and Commerce Committee. And as I said, these are, these are the committees that we really care about. So we're always trying to generate, build those relationships with members of Congress who sit on those committees. Yeah, and they are all broken into subcommittees as well. Um, which um, which allows us to focus even further. Um, and we'll get into that around yeah. appropriations. Yeah. Um, so the administration's role, so we're touching on this ever so briefly. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services is the agency we care about, and it oversees 11 sub-agencies. So the ones we care about are listed below there, FDA, CDC, NIH, CMS. So agencies and sub-agencies can issue rules or regulations. And while these don't have the same sort of force as legislation, because usually they expire after, after a certain period of time, they're more short term, they are pretty powerful. Um, and so it's, uh, they, they can you can do a lot through through the regulatory arm. Yeah, for instance, um, we w had been working for some time with uh, the FDA on an effort to make sure that laboratory developed tests had a regulatory scheme to make sure that they're safe for patients. Now we haven't been able to successfully got uh, have them administer those final guidelines um, on those regulations, but that's sort of an example of the type of one type of regulation that could be impactful. And similarly, CMS, that's the, the last um, one, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they set the parameters for payment and reimbursement around Medicare and Medicaid annually. So that is a very powerful position. Um, and of course, those influence the private insurance market. So incoming HHS secretary is Alex Azar. He was at HHS during the Bush administration in a different position, um, and he has spent the last decade in the pharmaceutical industry. And this is important because a lot of people say that it disqualifies him or qualifies him to serve in the role, but he has made a lot of noise about wanting to take action on drug pricing reform. He's made that clear that that's something he wants to do. Um, and while we probably won't pass legislation, there is a lot that can be done regulatorily on that. All right. So what are policymakers thinking about right now? So the top of mind issues here, we've got it's an election year, so that means there's both incentive and disincentive for the gotcha votes um, for members to build their records and take them back home. The other thing that's going to be big is debt ceiling, federal spending that is occupying a lot of space right now, sucking up all of the oxygen here in D.C. Um, and then immigration reform is another one. The Affordable Care Act. So while Republican leaders have backed off from repealing and replacing it, there is a need to do something to stabilize the marketplaces. So they've got to do something, and it's likely that they'll punt it until the very end of the year until they have to do something. 
but that is that's on the horizon. So then sexual harassment, this has um, sucked up a lot of oxygen, what to do about the situation in Congress specifically and then <laughs> more largely. Um, and lastly, drug pricing reform is a big one. So federal funding, so this, we're going to have to go through this really quickly. Yeah, and uh, again, we apologize, um, but but um, this will all be available so you can go back and look at this afterwards if you want to go um, slide by slide. And any follow-up questions, please, just send our way. Yeah. So timeline, uh, first Monday in February, right around the corner, the president will submit his budget request. So this has influence, but no teeth and no force. Um, then we have February 15th, CBO, that's the Congressional Budget Office, submits a report on the budget outlook to budget committees. Then the budget committees hold hearings on the president's proposals. And then, in theory, they take those into account. Um, depending on the dynamics, sometimes they'll totally disregard them. But then each budget committee and the House Senate, the House Budget Committee and the Senate Budget Committee, they go back and they craft their budget resolutions. And these set top line spending levels, so it's kind of like a household budget. Mm -hmm. And that directs the Appropriations Committee to then figure out how they're going to meet those levels and how the funding is allocated across agencies and across programs. So uh, we haven't, importantly, we have not stuck to this timeline, I think, in probably a decade or more, but this is more or less what it looks like. Springtime is appropriations time, right. so we'll see the congressional budget resolutions come up, and those, well, they're supposed to be adopted by Congress. It doesn't really matter. Right. So right around February and March is a, a, when there'll be a real appetite for us to have an impact on. Um, appropriations requests and suggestions, and so that's why we're having our advocacy day in March. Right, right. And then the House Appropriations Committees instruct their subcommittees to drill down on what, what the spending package looks like in, in compliance with these top line levels set by the budget. Um, so then the fiscal year is October 1st through September 30th. Yeah. Importantly, um, and right now, actually you can flip the slide, Chad. So key terms and con concepts. So the Congressional Budget Resolution, we talked about this. This is the outline of anticipated revenue and planned spending. Um, then appropriations. So these are, the, that's the real funding. Um, and the Appropriations Committee has 12 subcommittees. Each of these subcommittees corresponds with a standing appropriations bill. So these are, um, the, there are 12 of them, yep. and they're divided by agency. And so the thinking is that each committee has oversight over a small piece of it, and then it all comes together. Now, this past year, the House did pass 12 appropriations bills. It did, and, yes. But the Senate did not. And so because of that, um, we weren't able to have any <laughs> appropriations go through the normal process which is why we have continuing resolutions. Yes, so these are, this has been in the news lately a lot. I think the current continuing resolution expires on Monday. So these are short-term stopgap spending resolutions, and basically what they do is they provide for static spending levels, spending at the same amount for some defined period of time. Um, and then we have mandatory versus discretionary spending. This is basically um, just something that's important to know generally. Mandatory, those are entitlement programs. That means that the government and Congress doesn't set those spending levels. So Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, things like that, they're all mandatory, meaning that, like it or not, Congress has got to pay those out. Discretionary, those are, that's where Congress does set those levels. They do have influence. And so then moving on, authorization versus appropriation. A lot of people confuse these concepts. Think of it like this. The authorization is permission to appropriate the funds. Yep. And usually with programs, one of our programs, Johanna's Law, which we'll get into down the road a bit, um, is authorized. It's authorized for a defined period of time, but the authorization lapsed in 2012, so it needs to be reauthorized. But Congress is still appropriating funds, so it's it's not terrible, right? It's good. In fact, there's this tension of do we draw attention to this or do right. we not? But um, the authorization is is important to have and comes 
first before the appropriations piece of it. So this, I think we've already kind of been over yep, this. Yep, so we'll skip past that's the, the appropriations. Committee. These are the 12 uh, categories for, that correspond with the 12 appropriations bills that are required each year. And we care about two of them, which it, are those in red, defense and labor, health and human services, education and related agencies. So specifically, our dogs within, within each of those buckets, we have National Institutes of Health um, and National Cancer Institute. So this is the government's primary agency for cancer research. Um, and it is a very important, but also you have to keep in mind that it funds all cancer. So, you know, ovarian cancer competes with other cancers. Um, we have Johanna's Law, which is CDC. And so this, again, the CDC is funded through labor HHS appropriations. And so whatever that's funded up for that year um, is sort of sets the programs um, and, and their bandwidth at CDC to pursue ovarian cancer programs. And Ovarian Cancer Control Initiative is also operated by CDC and they're really into surveillance and um, they do some genomics research mm -hmm. and other things. Then DOD. So this is interesting. This is like a, a great a great program, and you wouldn't expect it to be housed in Department of Defense. But in Department of Defense, they have the congressionally that whoops, there's a typo. The congressionally directed medical research program, CDMRP, and CDMRP is comprised of about 30 disease specific programs that really zoom in on research and they do more sort of cutting edge research, things that would not qualify for NIH funding. And they have, for our purposes, are extremely important, not just materially, but also because it's the only dedicated funding stream, federal funding stream for ovarian cancer. Right, Congress each year determines the amount of money that will be spent um, for the, in the upcoming year on research for those programs. And that's real in a way that, you know, if Congress appropriates X dollars to NIH and X of those are to be used on cancer research, you know, we have no say. It's really gonna be an agency level decision what slice of the pie, how big a slice of the pie ovarian cancer gets. So this is probably where we do have the biggest impact. So here you can see how it's all broken down. Um, the biggest funding stream is NIH. Um, and again, but that number um, is generally about 130, 140 million a year, but that number is a little bit tricky to, to hone in on. It's self-reported by NIH, and we're not always sure whether or not all of that research money isn't double counted by some, some other like tip, tip, uh, types of research that might be ovarian and some, some other type of cancer that they double count. So um, it, it's important, and they do do the bulk of it, but don't get um, blown away by that oversized blue bar in the middle. Yes. But you can see that our funding has um, generally um, increased by small increments over the past 20 years, so that's good news. Yes. All right, so our policy issues, and this only covers like the next few months, very near term, but oral parity. So for those of you who don't know what this is, we are advocating for a piece of legislation that provides parity and coverage for orally administered anti-cancer medications and IV administered anti-cancer medications. And so what this means is when you go to your oncologist office and you get chemo, that is charged under your medical benefit. This is a fixed amount. It's whatever your copay is. It's $25, $50, whatever it is. But even if it's the same medication and it's prescribed in pill form, you're subject to a coinsurance, which is a percentage of the total cost of the drug. I'm sure some of you have experienced this picking up your prescriptions at the pharmacy. So it's not that fixed amount. And with some of these newer drugs that are thousands of dollars a month, you know, 20% of that quickly becomes cost prohibitive. And so what this bill does, it would provide for a level playing field. It would say you have to provide the same level of coverage regardless of whether the medication is taken orally or intravenously. And it applies only to a select plan, only to select plans, um, these would be the self-funded employer-based plan, employer-sponsored plans. 
So in the state level, we've seen, I think, almost all, all of the states, maybe 43 actually, they yep. pass parity legislation of some type. But people in their states still aren't covered because if they have one of these plans, these ERISA, ERISA plans, they're exempt from state level regulation, meaning that those laws don't apply to these plans. So those people are not accessing the benefit. So that is hot and burning. Then funding for programs and research. This, because it is about to be that time, springtime is appropriations time. So that's going to be a big one for us. And then introduction of legislation to reauthorize funding for Johanna's Law. So if you'll remember that authorization piece, that's really important. That is basically giving Congress permission to fund a program for a specific number of years, right? And so with Johanna's Law, the last reauthorization lapsed in 2012. And Congress has kept funding it because it does not require this permission per se, but it's always a good idea to make sure your authorizations are current. Yeah, that's so, right. And and for those on uh, that we haven't really described because of time, but that was is important to us as it really promotes awareness of gynecologic cancer, specifically ovarian cancer, but gynecological gynecologic cancer in general. Um, and it's um, as we said, a CDC administered program. And so we're, we will be looking. Um, to reauthorize that, that bill in this Congress. And so we've been working with the CDC and with our congressional allies to determine the best way to go about doing that. And so stay tuned for more information on that. Yes, yes. And then the last one is building the Congress, and all of these are linked together to a certain degree, building the Congressional Ovarian Cancer Caucus. So um, this is our bipartisan caucus in the House, and it's led by Representatives Rosa DeLauro from Connecticut and Sean Duffy. And they're great at circulating letters of support for our programs and other things. And so they will be reintroducing the legislation to reauthorize Johanna's Law. And the hope is that if we start building the caucus, we have built-in support with that. So now to put all of this in context and to come full circle back to advocacy, um, let's say that with one of our policy priorities, oral parity, for instance, this is a policy priority, and uh, let's say that I want a member of Congress to co-sponsor the legislation. Then I, that's my ask, right? So with advocacy and communications with public officials, it's really important to have a defined ask. As Chad said at the beginning of all of this, they want to please you. They want to when to take back home. So it's almost doing them a favor to have a really clear, concrete, policy-related ask. <clears throat> so seize every opportunity to plug that ask. If this is a proactive piece of legislation, as oral parity is, every time that the cost of cancer drugs, any time that that's in the news, if I'm trying to get a member to co-sponsor that legislation, I send those articles to those offices. Any, any sort of news event, anything that, that gets it extra resonance right now is, is, is important to seize upon. Um, so then other ways to engage here, we encourage everyone to sign up for our OCRFA activation emails. So this would be around key debates, healthcare debates um, that affect the ovarian cancer community. We send out an alert that says, call your members of Congress Here's the number, I think it even dials it for you, um, and or write them. And here's, here's a template to write a letter to them expressing your support or objection to whatever the policy is. So it's great whenever you're advocating in these ways to make yourself bigger, make yourself bigger. Organize fellow constituents to echo your message. Um, also, attending town hall meetings and in-district events I, I think that those were being held a lot. Um, and then we saw them taper off. I imagine that they'll kick back up again because it's an election year. So that's a great opportunity to ask your question. And that is kind of, um, you don't necessarily have to have a defined ask because it's a public forum. So let's say you just wanted a broad question. What are you gonna do to fight ovarian cancer if I vote for you? You know, that's a great, great way to get them on the record to do things in these public settings. Um, so then those are all things that kind of are, are, are you seizing on opportunities, but you can also proactively engage by writing op-eds or letters to the editor for local news publications. So one thing you should know, the way to a member of Congress's heart is coverage. Mm -hmm. If you can show them 
that an issue that you care about and that you want them to act on is getting a lot of coverage, they'll pop because they love coverage. They see that as, as votes for them. They see that as exposure. So uh, that's probably the best avenue to get through to them, but you can also write, email, or call members of Congress's offices. Um, typically, you won't have a meaningful conversation if you call that someone will, quote, unquote, record your message and tell the congressman, uh, but they will record it in their system and you'll be, it will be in their records that you have this position on whatever the issue is. Um, so then you have using social media platforms to share your story, disseminate your message. So again, it's, it's, social media seems to be the way of the day. Most members of Congress have social media accounts that you can tweet at them or Facebook them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think that politically, social media, for various reasons, is becoming more and more. Yeah, and if you, and that's exactly right. It's yeah. becoming out, an outsized impact. And if you have. Um, if you ever want help drafting or you want a template on how to write these things, um, we're always here to help with that. And we, in fact, it would be great if you did reach out to us because we might have some extra information that would be useful in writing those. And by the same token, we'll record what action you're taking so that we know when we go back into that office, we have um, a, a record of um, constituents taking action. So if you need help, with um, any of that writing uh, or uh, drafting of any of that, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Here are uh, Vanessa and my uh, email address. Um, so make sure you take those down and reach out to us if you don't have those already. And we also wanted to make sure you're aware of our advocacy day, which is very exciting. Yes. That's taking place here in Washington, D.C., March 4th to 6th. Um, we'll, we'll have an all-day training session on March 5th and then um, head on up to Capitol Hill all day on March 6th where you'll meet, you'll, you'll meet with members of Congress and their staff, um, and it's usually a, a really exciting day. It is, it is, and pictures are taken that are great fun. Um, it's a great way to connect with the community, and um, I will say that it's, it's fruitful for everyone because, you know, it's, it's important to have your the constituents go and making ask and getting FaceTime and all of those things. So it's I, I we've heard very good feedback. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think uh, it's definitely worth checking out, um, and it is open to the public. So it's worth checking out and passing along to your friends. And if you're not able to come this year, then help push it out over social media because we're doubling down yep. on our social media engagement. And you can register advocacy. online. Um, yes. On the OCRFA.org website, go to advocacy, and you'll you'll see um, you'll see where you can uh, register. Um, we also have um, um, a great rate for a hotel yes, for those two days if you'd like to come on in. So I'm sorry that we went over time, um, but uh, we're willing to stick around for a few minutes um, for anybody who's still interested <laughs> that we didn't lose during that time. And again, thank you so much for your. Um, for being with us today. Thank you, Chad and Vanessa. That was great. A ton of good information, um, really clearly uh, explained. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one question, looks like the question that we have typed in there right now is about Advocacy Day, which you guys just um, answered. One um, question I thought some may have is, do, um, do folks need to have any previous experience with advocacy to come to Advocacy Day? Um, I, I just know that if it were me, that could be something that I would be worried about. That's a great question, Sarah, and, and the answer is no. Um, we'll, we'll do um, a training session um, on the, uh, the day before we go on to the Hill, on the 5th, and we would ask you to, to make sure you're there for that session. Um, you'll be paired up with other people um, who have done this before. Um, sometimes you'll be paired up with staff when you go on the Hill. We'll do mock meetings beforehand to show you exactly what to expect. Um, and um, frankly, I've found that people who, who haven't done it before are sometimes the most impactful because they have a real genuine experience on the Hill and they're just there to tell their story um, and that resonates with staff and members of Congress. Thank you, Chad. That's great. Yeah, I can say personally when when it was my first uh, my first trip to the Hill, I was you know nervous, but it was an amazing experience. Um, 
really just incredible for someone who, like me, who does not live in the D.C. world of politics and breathe that every day. Um, it was really an incredible experience. So I will echo Vanessa and Chad in saying that and encouraging people to think about attending. Um, okay, so I'm not seeing any other questions being typed in. Um, so maybe we will just wrap it up. Um, so thank you again to Chad and Vanessa for calling in, and thank you to everyone who called in today. Um, a survey should pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar, and we appreciate any feedback. Um, it's always helpful to us and helps us come up with ideas um, as we put together future webinars. Um, and and uh, yes. Oh, sorry to interrupt you, Sarah. I just wanted to no, say thanks. we're going to be drilling down because we, this is so much ground to cover, but on the specific funding streams and kind of what they do and what programs they fund, we're going to have a series of webinars in February. So okay, look for more on, on, on that if you um, want to go a little deeper on some of this stuff. That's great. Perfect. All right. So. On that note, stay tuned, everybody. Um, you can always log on to our website, ocrfa.org, for more information. And uh, thank you all, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.